Well, hello, it's Wednesday, and I, lo and behold, am posting another podcast, which is so exciting because I said I wanted to try to post a few more podcasts in a week, and here I am posting another podcast. See, if I can do three in a week, that will be podcast goals right now, and Also, I get some more equipment in the mail, which will hopefully make this audio even better than what it is now. And it's not good right now. And and I don't know if you can even hear the difference. Hopefully, after this gear, you'll be able to hear, a, you know, it's better. But I am very excited. So maybe on Friday we will have better audio quality or maybe not it might be next week. But so my goal is three podcasts in a week. So here's number 2. Today was a really really good day. Everest and I spent a lot of time outside and in the water. And just a lot of sensory things, which is super fun, and on swings, and yeah, in the sun, and so, and then played mini golf. We just did a lot today with um, the family, and it was really fun. I don't know why I wanted to share that with you today, but I did, and I, there you go, there you go. So, I'm actually recording this at midnight, which is super fun and funky fresh. It's pretty good. So, it's kind of good. I am going to be talking about my journey through, like, I want to call it my basketball journey. But, I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet. You'll see. But I'm going to be talking about, like, all the things that I learned along the way of my basketball career. And it's funny because I look back now and there's so many different people that, like, focused on photography or focused on singing or playing an instrument or something that you can carry into, like, the next phase of your life, like, after high school and college and I chose to focus on something that was legit like limited to you know high school college I mean you could go pro but I guess that was my something I wanted to do when I was super young but I think by high school I knew I wasn't really gonna go pro it's pretty pretty on point with that um but lo and behold I did learn a lot along the way and the things that I learned are very very extremely most definitely for sure 100% applicable to daily life even though the sport itself may or may not be applicable to daily life unless you're like a basketball coach or a gym teacher or yeah that's about it uh so unless you want to i guess no no that's about it daily life of course i haven't i don't think i yawned in the last podcast now come to think of it must have been like a good it was not in the morning and it wasn't at night it was in the middle of the day wow fancy no yawn okay so my basketball journey started very very young well actually no i was older than most people when they start sports What I learned when I started sports in sixth grade was that most people start sports in, like, kindergarten or first grade, which to me, or preschool, 
blew my mind that people would start so young. So naturally, I thought that I was at a disadvantage. Oh, I started in sixth grade and everyone else started like kindergarten or pre-K, you know. And here I am starting six, seven years later than most people, which, you know, you would think you get quite a bit on somebody in that amount of time. But you're also very young, so it's not, you can only pick up so much. Well, I don't know. Anyways, I started in sixth grade. And because I went to a private school, I think you could only start sports in fourth grade. Oh, I'm not sure why this is, but you can't start until fourth grade in the private school system I was in at the time. But I didn't even think to start sports until sixth grade. I don't know, maybe my parents thought of it. Maybe I was turning like ADHD and they thought of it. I don't know how I got to play sports at that time I know my sister started at fourth grade but I being older didn't start until sixth grade so I started and everybody started telling me right away like I was I was athletic and so I could do things like people would show me what to do and then I would just do them like I would just copy what they did and I was not thinking it was really, like really that special or anything. I didn't really know I was athletic or I didn't really think I was athletic or good at that. But I just had lots of energy and I started to really like it. And so people would tell me, do this and I would just do it. You know, a move or a shot or whatever, run or jump or whatever it is. I would just do it. And... People would tell me after the games like that I was just a natural or whatever. And I can't imagine I was that good in sixth grade, but I was good for a private, small private school in Minneapolis, you know, compared to who all the people we played. Now, I know we didn't play many good teams, but I there was one team that was pretty good. But... People just started telling me, like, oh, you're a natural. I remember after games, people coming and telling me that. I specifically remember it vividly. And I kind of was like, oh, I'm good at this. Like, this is kind of fun, you know? And I, I knew I was good at... I Actually, you know what? I said earlier I didn't know I was athletic. I I could run the mile really fast. I would run it faster than many of the boys, you know, girls develop apparently sooner, faster, quicker, and they are stronger than boys until 16 or junior high or, I mean, um, sophomore year. But so I found this to be true until I turned to be a junior in high school. I could still beat the boys sophomore year. They were still not as strong, but, you know, sophomore year to junior year, there's something that happens to boys. They'd like... Turn to mini men, you know, some mini men. They do turn to mini men. They're not men, but they're like mini men, kind of. They're not like boys, you know, anymore. Anyways, they're like, they somehow get strong. Anyways, so so anyways, I start sixth grade, and then we end up moving to a suburb. We left Minneapolis, and we moved to a suburb of Minnesota. And uh, there, it was. I went to a, a public school, and that's where most people started sports. You know, babies as babies as baby babies, literal infants. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, they started really young, and. Um, there was a traveling team there and um you know there was only one team in the private school I went to cuz they could barely have a, a team at all cuz it's private you know but in the public school they have like a house team like a house regular basketball team and then they have 
and you know they had the A B C squads whatever. But then I also there was also a traveling team that traveled all over the minute the state to play different teams and I found out about it and I went to try out and I made it. And so the the team that I was trying out for um was kind of like a tight group. And it's funny because there was a post. Well, it's not funny, but it's just kind of strange because there was a there's this group was tight and there was a girl that was a post and I was I'm pretty sure I was taller than her at the time. And I must have somehow done something different. But anyways, I beat out their post because I was super tall, like, at the time. Like, I was taller than most girls in sixth grade. And the girl that was going to be their post, I beat out. And the, the team was not happy because this was one of the girls that was with them since when they were... F- kindergarten you know what I mean like they were together this whole time and then now I come in and take out this other girl that had been with them forever and the point guard of the group was just was very mad and then um proceeded to treat me horribly our entire time that entire year of basketball, it was kind of like torture. It was really, it was bullying for sure. Because thing is, I came in, I didn't know plays. I didn't know how plays worked. Like when I played at the, when I played at the private school, they didn't run plays. You just got to get open and get the ball and do what you want or pass or shoot. But on this organized team, Sorry about the noises. Everest is still not down. This is the next day that I'm finishing this podcast. He is not down for a nap. So you might hear some cooing in the back. But yeah, it was like, it was like definitely bullying And when I didn't understand a play or I didn't understand a move, mostly this one person was horrible to me, acting like, saying like, acting like I was super stupid. You know how people like do that? They make you feel like belittle you and make you feel stupid and all that. Well, that was our only interaction with this between me and this person. And it was really hard. Some of the girls were nicer. Uh, Some of the girls were nicer. I do remember that, you know. But some of them kind of, they all kind of banded with this one person that was kind of, she was kind of a bully and kind of the ringleader of the team because I guess the point guard is always the ringleader. I don't know. Not necessarily, but mostly. And so it was really hard. I think I lost a lot of self-esteem during that time. I started to put my entire identity through this level of basketball, if I could do something right or not. I didn't really know how to dribble, so then I was looked down upon or I felt that way by this one person. And then, you know, I don't think really the team, I didn't feel that from the rest of the team, just from this one person, but this one person was one of the better players on the team at the time. And so, uh, 
I just started to view my identity through basketball. And, you know, if I did something really well, then I was a good person and I was worthy. If I did something bad or wrong playing basketball, then I was not worthy and I was scum and I was not good enough. And it's it's so crazy to think back to that time and where that stems from and that I'm not over it today. Like, it's crazy. I will do any sort of which what thing. Like, it could be playing a game of bags, like cornhole, and if I do well, then I feel this way. But if I don't, it's I, I have to fight and and remember that my identity is in Christ and that whether I do good or bad, it doesn't define who I am. It's just a game, right? But it's funny because it has marked me my entire life in such a impactful way. And, and, and I know that people talk about, you know, when you are a child, you know, things that are said or done mark you in a big way. Well, you know, this you know, had marked, like, has marked me, but I think this is just um, a point, and it's a place where the Lord can come in and completely destroy that mindset, you know, it's possibly, you know, a stronghold, so it's just something that the Lord has to do, you can't do if you have a mindset that's like this or it doesn't have to be like this at all it could be completely different something that has marked you but it plagues you to this day of something from long ago it's just something you're holding on to and your spirit just can't seem to let go but the lord will help you let go the lord will destroy that that wrong mindset and will renew your mind with the truth you only go about doing that by seeking the lord and spending time in his word and spending time with him alone in the secret place and your secret place could be anything any room just where you're alone and you shut the door and you have no distractions little baby sneezes are the cutest and and you can be alone with the Lord and, and let him work in your heart and speak to you about these things. What is the truth? What does the word say about this wrong mindset? And what does the word say is actual facts of heaven? What is the kingdom version of your thoughts? So... Yeah, it's a really awesome opportunity. Yeah, it's a it's a sad thing that has that happened, but really it's an opportunity for the Lord to do a miracle in your life and and let him let him. And so, okay. So I played that that kind of marked me in basketball, you know, and and I continued on. I finished that year and uh, I went on in seventh grade and eighth grade, and I continued on the basketball team, the traveling team, and I began to uh, feel like I'm not worthy enough to take a, a shot. I'm not good enough that somebody else, because in during that time, I didn't feel if I made a mistake or because I was on that team new and the rest of them had been there forever. I felt like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to mess it up for everybody, so I better not take a shot. I was already taking it so seriously, the game, by that time. And that was only my, you know, technically first year playing basketball, full year. Because I started basketball in, in sixth grade in the private school and then finished in the, you know, public school and so I adopted this mindset that I am not good enough to take a shot I remember my parents 
I never shared this with them. I don't think I shared that with this this with them about the 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 somewhat bullying that was happening on the team. And um I wish I would have said something to her and I wish I would have had the mindset I have now about playing that I, you know, that I can do it and that I can take a shot and I you know, I mean, it's just it's okay. But it would have been nice. So anyways, um in 7th grade and 8th grade, I kind of followed suit. I <clears throat> never really felt like I was that like I I knew I was good at basketball, but I didn't feel like I should take a shot. I'm sorry. I'm just watching my baby destroy our prayer room with Bibles, throwing them everywhere. Okay, so anyways, like that I should be taking a shot or that if I were to take a shot and then I miss, that I would let down the team and that I shouldn't do that, that I should just not take a shot at all. And when I think about that, it's like, why are you even playing the game if you're not going to take a shot at all? And I, I, I did take shots that were like guaranteed, like a layup or you know, in the paint, like close in the paint, you know, and if I was wide open or something, but like if it was having to do a drive and a maneuver, you know, or a farther out shot, you know, I would, I would uh, pass it off often. And yeah, it's just the mindset followed and seventh and eighth grade that continued into high school uh, I got better, and uh, by sophomore year, I was on the varsity team. Hey, hold on. By the time I was in high school, <clears throat> I still had this mindset, but I was more open to taking a shot. My parents had been speaking into me, you know, speak that it would go in type of things and when I would speak that the ball would go in before a free throw or a shot they would oftentimes go in often I got better at shooting and I got more confidence you know but I still had that mindset in the back of my mind if I took a shot and I missed um it would be the end of the world and I should just not take very many shots if uh, you know very many I played on the JV team I guess I wasn't on varsity by sophomore year. I was on JV or varsity. I think I was on the JV and I sat for varsity. That's what it was. So technically I was on the varsity team, but I only played like the last few seconds of the, any game. So, well, it would be maybe sometimes five minutes, but if we were way ahead, you know. So anyways, I grew in confidence, and I played with the older girls, which was definitely confidence building. And I did have skill, you know, for certain. One thing I do remember from my high school coach, I learned endurance. And what's funny is that I used all the other sports I played as a time of conditioning for me to get my life ready for basketball when I was going to play basketball like so I did cross country and I did track and I just used those as times of conditioning so that when it was time for basketball I was already in like good condition my heart was you know everything was in line and I was ready to run a lot So, I remember just building this mindset that I used in basketball. I'm not, it's kind of hard to explain, but if I can explain a little bit, it would be this. No matter what your body is feeling, no matter what pain you're in, no matter what is burning, just keep going. Just keep moving at the pace that you're at. Just keep pushing. It's almost done. And it's not going to last long. And 
literally like see the pain like as if it's a physical wall and put your head down and push through it because it won't last and it's almost over you know and so especially in basketball you're just doing sprints whereas in cross country you are running distance like miles for hours so basketball running you know is quicker and it's not as long although I will say that basketball conditioning is a lot more painful. Well, I guess I would say they're painful and different in their own way. They're both painful. and But anyways, I remember learning that through that time and really valuing that understanding of pain and suffering if you will and it's really aided me throughout life and I have truly been become better person have become a better person because of that in so many ways and I'm so grateful for that gift of knowledge you know and um, I went through my junior year in high school a time where I was on the varsity team and I started doing in school I started doing advanced placement classes I tested into them and I started taking college courses that were extreme, a lot harder than high school courses. Because in high school, you didn't need to study. You just show up and kind of do the work and you're fine. Um, but in college courses and AP classes, you legitimately had to study or you would not do well. And I didn't really understand that at the point. I just wanted to kind of have the status because it was kind of like a status thing to have you know, say that you're be, that you're doing those kind of courses, you know, and college courses obviously are going to go towards your, you're going to get the actual, excuse me, credit for doing the course instead of having to pay 300 to $3,000 for that course in college. So, you know, naturally that's free money. And Anyways, I was taking those courses, and I did not do well. That was around the time when texting came out, and, you know, you could start texting, and I got a phone, and I loved having a phone, so I was texting a lot through those classes, and the tests were extremely hard. You had to memorize most things, which in college it was like that. You had to memorize, like a geography test I took. I had geography, and you had to memorize dates and history and crazy stuff and so I just didn't take that time to do that and then I ended up failing that college course and which in turn affected my basketball and I got bumped from the varsity JV to the B squad and At the time, I had a few friends that I didn't feel were as good of players as me. Although they worked very hard, my natural ability was better than their natural ability. But these people played very, very hard. So they were able to move up in my place on the varsity. And... That bothered me. I went into a weird spell of depression during that time. A, because I had never failed a course in my life. And that marked me. It was detrimental. I'll never forget, you know. I think if you get a C, you fail. Which I think, but I think I was like D. I was actually failing. And, um... And then 
so because I was failing a course I couldn't play you know at a higher level or you know and I was my friends started dating people boys and they were often with their boyfriends and uh, I just went into this weird depression that year and I isolated myself I stayed home I wouldn't ever want to go out because I really only wanted to hang out with my friend because I was hurting in a lot of ways and but my friend would hang out with me sometimes or she would want to hang out with me at her boyfriend's house with her boyfriend's friends and I just didn't because I was not doing good in my heart and I wasn't interested in hanging out with those people and I remember just feeling very alone during that season. I spent a lot of time at home and a lot of time with family just feeling alone, you know? And um, I could have been with the Lord. I could have spent time with the Lord. I could have worked on getting my grades up. I don't know if I could have gotten it up. I don't know if I could have done anything or if it was because I failed that course in that semester or trimester, whatever we had. I don't know. But anyways, moving on into from junior year to senior year, I believe. Oh, no, no, no. I can't remember one summer. I think it was sophomore year to junior year. Actually, I skipped a stage of basketball. I ended up playing on a very elite basketball team with like all division 1 players that played in the big 10 in the big 10 division 1 and because i had a certain level of athleticism they saw that i could be an asset whereas i severely lacked confidence compared to these other women again with that from stemming from early childhood, you know, childhood years of not feeling like I sh- not really wanting to mess anything up. I just didn't want to mess anything up, you know, or make the team mad or whatever. And oh. so when I got on this team, the coach was Hitler. I mean, he just wanted us to do well or whatever, but he was not a very nice person in general and very mean, very cutting, very just pulled you down, wasn't uplifting, wasn't inspiring, wasn't a good person at all. And on the court, at least, I didn't really get to know him off the court. We didn't spend that time, but not... I don't think he would categorize him as a good coach, even though he was the coach of one of the most highest level women basketball players. So I traveled all summer with this team all over the United States and some of the the biggest coaches in the United States women's basketball D1 saw me. Um, I got a few different looks at different elite Ivy colleges, but it wasn't about that. I mean, yes, it was for, like, why I joined, you know, to be seen and get a scholarship and all that, but I wanted to grow as a player, and he, this coach... I don't want to blame it on the coach because I had my own things I was going through, but he wasn't helpful. He was only cutting. And I really needed to get through, you know, these past things. So I went on this team and I think I was sunk lower into uh 
pit of not wanting to mess things up because of the coach and not feeling confident and not growing, just shrinking back more than ever, never, you know, sprouting or not growing. And, and I all, also I would say I didn't have the right mindset. I just was so focused on an inward me and not like of the team or stepping out or growing or having a different, better attitude. I just didn't have that at the time. So I became even more scarred in a way when it came to basketball, like feeling like I'm less of less value, you know, even less value than before. And because again, remember my identity, I said in sixth grade, my identity became basketball. And if I didn't do the very best or I wasn't the best on the team, I was not doing well. I needed to be the best. And of course, you're never going to be the best. There's always someone better and there's always someone not as good. So, you know, learning that along the way. And it's still hard to accept You know, it's kind of a weird thing, but I could never really just play the game for fun. Oh, it was fun when we won or when we were winning or doing well, you know, of course. But it was very serious. And then I went back to high school ball and I was back on the varsity team as well as, you know, skipping over junior year because that's what happened in junior year. And then in senior year, you know, I became varsity And but not one of the starting best varsity players because I was very had very low confidence. I had high confidence. Like I was like trying to have high confidence like I wanted to and I would force myself through. But it wasn't like a default. I guess you would say to have confidence. It was not second nature, you know, or first nature. It was like I had to force it through. And a college did end up seeing me, but it was a Division three college, and I ended up going and playing. Although I was severely burnt out of basketball after senior year, I decided to play in college because... Again, it was my identity. If I didn't have basketball, what did I even have? Do I have anything? Am I of any value? Even if I'm of bad value, I'm of some value. You know, even if I don't do well or I'm at least part of something, you know. And granted, I did play well, which is where some confidence came. But my biggest fear was to mess things up, if that makes sense. And I held my value in it. Whew, the Lord has to do some work still, because I can feel it, yo. And um, so I joined the team in college, and my best friend, my best friend from high school also joined. We wanted to stick together. And I did look at some other colleges besides the one close in town. But, um, you know, I don't think I got accepted. I'm sure my friend did. But she ended up wanting to play basketball, so she went. And I think school was cheaper where we went. And I think there was, I'm not sure exactly. I think, it, I don't know if it was just basketball that draw her or if it, like school was cheap or what. But for the first two years doing um, some community college is good. And um, so we played that first year and our coach was a beast. He yelled a lot made us run a ton he was a slave driver really and um spat in your face and made you run and a drill sergeant you know um and at first I didn't like coach 
I don't know if anyone did. And the girls before us had won national champions. And um, there were only eight of them, which is crazy. So that means only three subs, essentially. No, that's not right. Yeah, three subs. And um, so you're basically playing the entire game. And... Yeah, that, that's insane. But the thing about coach is that he'll take a, a mediocre player. Now, this is a good coach. This is what a coach is supposed to do, which I don't think I've ever had any coach besides coach. You know, he was the one true coach. Or, or maybe he's just a magnificent coach, an actual, really genuinely good coach, where he'll take a, a mediocre player And he'll turn them into an all-star. Like, just an incredible player. And that's what he did with our team. And every team he touched. And, um... One of the lessons I learned along the way was that... He would be teaching us something or we would be running a play and he would stop everything and then tell you you're wrong and then if you were to talk back he would have you run so whether he was right or wrong you just wouldn't talk back and that happening just grew at first it was hard for anyone to not talk back but once you learn to not talk back then you how do I explain this I kind of learned this and used this later on in life when people or bosses or co-workers would you know, talk to me or try to tell me I did something wrong. And I just wouldn't talk back. And it really, it really grew me to not, to to hold my tongue, if you will, to, um, just grow in a lot of ways. And it's really shaped me in a big, in a big way. And, you know, recently I feel like I've lost that where I will speak back. But, you know, that, I feel like that's a really good reminder because I've never excuse me, forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. And I always think when I do, when I am like... If someone says something is wrong or I did something wrong or, you know, and I do speak back or kind of try to contest, that thought runs through my mind to just leave it like what Coach taught us. And really, it's very, very helpful. And it saves a lot of to just do what they're saying, you know, and just to leave it and move on it's just a good trait I feel and yeah it's just good so anyway holding your tongue I guess taming the tongue the bible says if Paul talks about how if you are can tame your tongue you've you are perfect you know and um I find that so true to not have a group or a community that, you know, to not be in a part of a community that gossips or slanders is a very rare thing and um, a very precious thing, genuinely. So 
it's 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 hard for people to do that. So there's that. But uh we went on to go to nationals. We got second place one year. I think both years we got in the top. But we never won, of course. And then the year after I left, they won again. So it was just funny how that worked out. It kind of the same thing happened to me in high school. And I played my first year. I played two total years. My the end of my first year, I ripped my ACL in like the best game of my life. Really sad. Coach would always tell me I'm an all American, like which is like a really high honor. It's a good good player. But I just was very stubborn and I didn't want to hustle. I didn't want to play. I was very burned out of basketball and I didn't want to try hard or work hard like I used to. It didn't mean the same to me anymore. I was burnt out. I was tired of trying to not mess things up. I just wanted to play wild. And I didn't really want to play hard and I didn't want to play smart. You know, I just wanted to be a part of something, I think, at that point. And so I didn't play hard. Do I regret it? Maybe. It's still I was older, you know, I mean, I was just as old as everybody else, but I just feel like my body was worn down quite a bit at that point and I just didn't have the hustle or the desire, you know. Which is sad and do I regret it? I you know, maybe a little and I thought at the time, will I regret this? I wondered if I would. Yes, to a degree. I think my biggest if I had to regret something, if I were to, it would be in 6th grade. I just but the thing is I couldn't I didn't know any better. Yes, my mom would talk to me and my parents would tell me to speak good things over myself, but I didn't know how woundly my identity was in basketball. And had I known what I know today, yes, of course, I would have played different. Things might have gone different, but is it the end of the world? I didn't get like a D1 scholarship and get a full ride. Not really. And honestly, well... A lot of my friends that went D1 were gay. They turned gay or society told them they were gay or they were supposed to believe that they were gay for some reason. And I don't know. I just am glad that that didn't happen to me, you know? And yeah, I don't know. And who's to say I would have turned gay or whatever, but I would hope that the Lord would keep me on the straight and narrow path. But, you know, when you're in that world and, yes, you're a little tomboyish, the world wants to tell you that you're something that you're not or try to get you to be a part of this whole group. And it's just wrong. It's demonic and it's not from the Lord. It's not the Lord at all. And I just... I'm grateful for that. You know, the Lord could have prevented that as well. So still playing D1 would have been amazing. But I would have just, I just needed a new mindset. I needed a whole different perspective on basketball and myself in the game. And I just didn't have it at that time. But all in all, I have this drive and this motivation for life and to always have something before me, a goal, a a dream, a vision, something I'm pushing for, something I'm striving for in a good way, not striving in a bad way. And I am so grateful for that. I'm so thankful that I have been instilled with good things. Yes, I have that major thing that happened and the Lord has worked that out and is still working it out. Um, But there are much more good things, you know, that have been instilled in me. Drive, endurance, energy, 
desire, you know, just a desire to do more, a desire in a good way, a a good, like, I always love to have something that I am pushing for, a goal, something that is in front of me that I can hope for, you know. Now, whether whatever it is turns out or not, like I've ran a marathon before, just a goal, something to achieve for fun, for for whatever, I don't know, but for a, an experience, you know, I have the YouTube channel, I love pushing for better and for more and for information that will be shared, you know, I love this podcast and I love... Um, sharing different stories and entertaining you even for a little bit or just being with you you know and sharing is so much fun and I really enjoy it I really love it and I hope that this story inspired you a little taught you maybe one thing at least and I hope you enjoyed today's podcast and I love you thank you for spending time with me and that was my basketball journey there were many many more lessons along the way I have notebooks and notes and notes and notes of of you know notes of things from basketball and uh, Mike Woods quotes, that kind of stuff, you know, but, um, being a part of something is really good. I think the biggest thing is to know that your identity is first in Christ and that however you play or don't play is not your identity and based in, it's just not your value. Your value is in Christ and the cross and he paid a monumental price for you today to be with him to choose him as your lord and savior his his price was his life the god of the universe his blood was the price his life was the price that he paid for you so your identity is not in whatever it is that you do or think or have or your status or your money nothing nothing none of that it's in the cross in Jesus' blood alone the monumental price of his blood is your value and maybe we don't fully understand that till we get to heaven but i pray that you can understand it a little bit more tonight, today. And I love you. Please leave a review and subscribe, and we will see you next time.